estamos aquí, bienvenidos al canal, estamos aquí con Hal Barwood, no sé si lo diré bien. Uh -huh. Bueno, pues escritor y guionista, entre otras cosas, del conocido Fate of Atlantis, de Indiana Jones, pero también ha sido guionista de La loca evasión, de Spielberg y coescritor de Encuentros en la tercera fase y colaboró en aquel corto que fue lo que inició con Lucas de THX 1138. Bueno, la primera pregunta es obligatoria, como fan de Lucas y de Spielberg, ¿cómo son George Lucas y Steven Spielberg? Eh, ¿Es fácil trabajar con ellos? ¿Los egos? ¿Mandan mucho? Well. Uh, I never worked very closely with George. George is a pal. Um, I've known these guys for, you know, half a century. But um, basically, uh, very friendly. These are just regular people who happened to have made very successful movies and became very wealthy. Uh, but uh, otherwise, they're just like any person, and the relationships are like what you would have with any person. Um, but. Uh, in the case of George, um, I, I never really worked closely with him. I did a few things for uh, uh, some of his films, very tiny. Um, but then eventually I went to work for George at, at a company called LucasArts, uh, building video games, uh, designing and building them. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's my relation there. And it's, it's hard to be a pal of a guy that you're working for. So for about 13 years while I was at LucasArts, I really wasn't very friendly with George, <laughs> but then I stopped working at LucasArts and we were friends again. So, uh, and with Steve, uh, it's different. Um, I worked very closely with Steve on several, several things. And um, uh, we, Matthew Robbins and I, uh, are, we were a writing pair. And we wrote Steve's first feature film, Sugarland Express. And we made fairly significant contributions to Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And, uh, you know, advised on the editing of E.T. a little bit, you know, stuff like that. We're hanging around. It's just, you know, it's a small group of people and, and uh, just in the course of friendly exchanges you, 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 you have some sort of impact on what's going on. Fate of Atlantis, eh, tres historias. Eh, ¿Por qué, en, por qué esa, esa decisión de separar la historia en tres vertientes, el arcade, el, el de la inteligencia y el normal? Fate of Atlantis was the, was the second Jones game that LucasArts did. And uh, the first one, Last Crusade, was based on the movie. And while, the, while uh, my friends, uh, Noah Falstein and David Fox and uh, Ron Gilbert, were busy building that game, they began to realize that the, the demographics of the audience, or the, the players, varied quite a bit. There were, there were those who wanted to see some of the action that Jones is famous for, There were others who were just only interested in the puzzling, and there were others who, who had a hankering for a little bit more social interchange. And so when uh, Noah and I designed the, the beginning, uh, it was a design collaboration between me and Noah Falstein. And uh, Noah was the one who had been on that other game, and he wanted to formalize that idea that we would, we would open the game up directly to people with different tastes in gaming. And so we decided to do the three paths, one of which is the, a path where you have a companion, Sophia Hapgood, and the other one, another one which is just more intensely puzzly, and then another one where you have to do some fighting. Hmm. And, uh, and we did it in order to be able to uh, accommodate this, this varying taste of our, what we had discovered was the varying taste of, uh, of people who played our games. Eh, porque nunca se llevó esta historia al cine. No, nunca quiso, nunca se quiso llevar porque siempre se consideró como en el cuarto episodio. Well, uh, thank you. <laughs> Gracias. Um, well, the reason that it's very simple. Outsiders often think that it should have been a movie, but you have to understand that Steven Spielberg and George Lucas would never make a movie that had already been produced in some other medium. So that would just never happen. And um, uh, I, I'm flattered that you and other people ask this question all the time because it, it makes me very proud of the story that we cooked up. <laughs> and it does have a sort of a movie quality as adventure games go. So, anyway. And, and you can have more fun playing that game than you can at any movie. <laughs> <laughs> Una versión en HD, se ha hecho versiones del Día de Tentáculo, de los Monkey Island. Veremos pronto una versión en HD de esta, porque es de los pocos que queda. Un remake. You know, I don't think it's going to happen. And I don't know what I think about that. Um, from, from the point of view of 2019, the graphics are pretty crude. <laughs> But 
um, for some reason, people haven't gotten interested in, in redoing that one. Uh, on the other hand, um, the Disney company, which bought the assets of George's company, Lucasfilm, and they shut down LucasArts as a company to make any more games, well-deserved, actually, but um, uh, they, they've revived some of the intellectual property, and you can, they are now, um, first of all, Indiana Jones, The Fate of the Last is on Steam in its present form, and it's also um, on a good old games. So Disney put it up on good old games and made sure you can play it on Windows 10. It's really good. Uh, they did the same thing with another of my games, uh, Inf Infernal Machine, Indiana Jones and Infernal Machine, which could not be played on Windows 10 because it's 16-bit 3D. And, and so Disney did a few sm small changes to make it still work, and it's really cool. So I'm very, pr I'm very pleased to see that these things still have a life. But, and I wish there would be some sort of graphic upgrade for that one. Um, but for some reason, it just hasn't happened, even though it's the, probably the most successful of all the, video, uh, all the adventure games that we did at LucasArts. And, um, so it would be nice, but uh, I can't give you an answer of why it hasn't happened. What has happened is that there are uh, uh, fans that are busy building other versions of Indiana Jones games that kind of derive from this, which is... Um, I've, I have two feelings about that. Uh, on the one hand, it's, it's very flattering, on the other hand, it's like what I would say to any young person, you know, go do your own stuff, you know? It's just as easy, and you'll be happier. <laughs> Hay otros juegos de Indiana Jones que también estuviste, pero que fueron cancelados, que es el Spear of Destiny y Indie in the Iron Phoenix. Eh, ¿Por qué fueron cancelados? No, I wasn't involved in that. No. 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 There, was a, there was another film, another, um, um, sorry, game, okay. uh, that was started but never finished. And I was involved a little bit in it, but only indirectly to try to help them fix up their story dramatically. But it involved um, the kind of supernatural uh, resurrection of Hitler in South America. And our largest audience, uh, for, for our lar largest uh, locale in the, in the world where people would play our games is Germany. And as a result of that, um, they, they just realized that if you do this story, we will never publish it. You can't, you can't have that story here. So it, it was abandoned. But I wasn't involved with Spear and Destiny, and I was just involved in uh, Fate of Atlantis, Infernal Machine, and Desktop Adventures. Eh, toda la documentación sobre casos ovnis en encuentros en la tercera fase, que es una película muy significativa, eh, ¿sois creyentes, eh, tanto Spielberg como, como tú, ¿O cómo, o cómo enfocasteis ese, ese tema? Well, I, I, I would love to believe in UFOs. <laughs> I don't quite. <laughs> y también. I, uh, uh, I thought in the days of Close Encounters and uh, that I thought we were on the verge of probably hearing from some aliens. And since then I've, I've changed my mind a little bit. And by the way, I'm currently writing a book about aliens <laughs> coming here, so I, I do kind of believe in them. Um, I think, uh, but I, I think it's more difficult than um, I thought in those days. And I guess the way I, I look at it now is that unless those Navy pictures that we've started to be seeing that, you know, are, are real and they are very, very spooky, those, those things showing objects over the ocean, um, those, those, are pretty, those are pretty weird. Um, and so that raised the hair on my neck a little bit when I saw some of those. However, I wonder, I, I think of two things. I think that when, when the SETI idea started, it was before we knew about any other planets. And so we thought, well, let's just put up ears and see if anybody's out there. And now we've found several thousand planets. And we know how to look for them. And we know how to look and find the ones out there. And we know several of them that are with planets that are in the habitable zone. We've discovered several of those, maybe a dozen. And what that tells me is that any civilization somewhere else in the galaxy that is a little bit in advance of us, they're looking at us right now. Just in the same way that we know there's a planet over in Gliese B or whatever it is that is habitable there are people somewhere looking at us. They, they know where Earth is and they, they know it's habitable. I'm sure, I'm sure that's true. And, I, and I, so I do think that, that we are being watched. 
And the novel is about that. Sorry for making the question. And so anyway, so I think that first that that you know that there if there are other if there are other. Uh, technical civilizations in, in the galaxy that they know about us. On the other hand, <clears throat> I wonder if, um, if it's really true that there is no deeper physics than Einstein's relativity ideas and there is no way to exceed the speed of light with a material object, then I wonder very much whether anyone in the galaxy, in the entire history of the galaxy, has ever traveled from star A to star B. We are alone and not alone. Yeah, well, we'll see, we'll see. <laughs> you know, I, I, um, I wrote a story a few years ago uh, called Glitterbush, and it's a story about how uh, it took a hundred years, but uh, another civilization sent basically seed pods to our planet and they grow bushes that are metallic and then the bushes are able to um, if you get tangled up in one it kind of turns you into one of them and uh, now I'm writing a successor to that book so I do imagine people uh, aliens getting here and whether whether they will be very friendly or not I'm not so sure <laughs> I, I, I think uh, creatures that wanted to come here would have a purpose. It's a very big enterprise, no matter who you are. And they would want, they would want something, and probably to live here, <laughs> maybe at our expense. <laughs> and I, I guess finally on that topic, on the other hand, if there is some sort of deeper physics and those Navy pictures are correct and there's somebody, somebody got here, All bets are off. <laughs> eh, yo quería preguntarte sobre la teoría de la conspiración. ¿Hasta dónde hay que creer? Eh, porque eh, encuentras una tercera fase es como un pilar o, para, o un, mucha gente se ha basado en esa película o la ha puesto como en el punto de mira como para a ver hasta dónde esconde el gobierno o no. Um, well, I was uh, I was uh, uh, kind of a minor creator there, so I don't want to take too much responsibility for for any of this. <laughs> Um, I just think it's a natural tendency of, of anybody in power to, to feel that they don't have such a tight grip on things and so they have to try to control everything. And I think that's kind of a natural tendency and it's certainly expressed in, in almost any kind of technical thing that's going on in the world. I'm sure we don't have, for example, right now, the full story on why the government of the United States is at war with Huawei. There is a deeper story there. It has nothing to do with, you know, espionage. It's something else. It's containment, you know, and that kind of stuff. I mean, it's, and they don't tell us that. You never hear that. So, and you don't have to be a conspiracy theorist to think that the government has got ulterior motives. <laughs> That's it. But I think that there's, uh, I have to also say, though, <clears throat> I, I don't feel much responsibility because the truth is, dramatically, um, it's thrilling for an, for a, a, an audience to see the secrets get out. And so that, that's why they're, they're, the secrets are there in that movie, really, is so you can have the pleasure of imagining them getting out. Pues muchas gracias. Ah, nice to meet you. <laughs> hey, can you... Uh, film? No sé si tendrás algún hueco por aquí. Oh, my God. Sure. <laughs> Don't, In the let, don't let that get away. <laughs> oh. Hola, um, David. 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 Sidney. David, sí. Yeah, where? Aquí, Here. aquí. Yeah, yeah, right there. Thank you. Ah. Thank you. Thank you.